Hey everybody, it's Thomas with Get Out Arizona in partnership with Photo Forum once again, and you're watching another great episode of Garage Talk, so let's get on it. Now today, obviously, we are going to be talking about the Canon R8 full frame mirrorless camera. And this will also be a review as I've had this camera for a couple weeks and I've been using it. Now, I've got some notes here and we're gonna take this a little bit differently. I'm just gonna methodically kind of go down the notes, talk about it, pros and cons of each one, and then at the end, give you my overall impression of the camera as well as who the camera's for. Now this uh, review, is not sponsored in any way. Photo Forum did lend me this camera, but they have no input on this review whatsoever. They're not paying me to do this review. And as of the airing of this review, this camera has already been returned to Photo Forum. Full disclosure, I do work part-time at Photo Forum a couple days out of the week because I enjoy photography and videography and sharing my experiences with my customers. So with that being said, let's dive right into it. So this is the Canon R8 full frame mirrorless camera using the new Canon RF mount. Although it's not really new, it's been out for a while. <clears throat> but this is the mount that has surplanted the Canon EF mount. And that's not even a discussion we're gonna have right now. So this camera has the Digix X processor, which is the same processor you'll find in the R6 Mark II, and it has a 24 megapixel full frame sensor. So this kit comes in at $16.99 US, body only $14.99 US, and we'll talk a little bit about that more towards the end of the review. And it's actually priced fairly well. This camera does not replace the Canon RP. In my opinion, it is an, or I should say it is an incremental stepping stone to the Canon R6 Mark II. <clears throat> and I would almost say the Canon R7, which is crop sensor, but we'll talk more about that at the end as well. Now, as I said, this is the RF mount, which gives you uh, great versatility in selection and lens. Um, full disclosure though, Canon still has the autofocus embargo going on right now. So third-party lens manufacturers, if they're manufacturing an autofocus lens, cannot manufacture lenses for the RF mount. This may have weight on your decision whether or not to go Canon or Sony. <clears throat> But to be honest with you, Canon has all the major lenses covered. 24 to 70, 70 to 200, 100 to 500, the 15 to 35, I believe it is, and the 24 to 105. Several prime lenses, some other zoom lenses. So when it comes to lens selection, yes, there's not as many as say Sony cameras with the E-mount, but you still have the ones you're going to need to get your job done. Just throwing that out there. And if you're not worried about autofocus, Lawa actually makes some really nice manual focus glass for the Canon RF mount. So um, that being said, now, <clears throat> as far as specs goes on this camera, <clears throat> it's an entry level full frame still. At $14.99 body only, and that's what we'll compare it to. And the RP, it does share some similarities and it shares some improvements as far as that goes. Mostly in the video enhancement, or uh, uh, video do we see the enhancements got a little bit better um, uh, EVF, which we'll talk about. And we have the multimedia shoe, which is Canon's new hot shoe, which will allow digital interface for microphones. Uh, they're coming out with a new line of flashes, so that'll be able to you know, do those flashes as well. So there are some improvements that we've seen over the RP, but Canon says this is not a replacement for the RP, and I would tend to agree with them. Now, when we look at the EVF, we have a two point, uh, let me look real quick. Okay, just wanna make sure it's not 2.6. It's actually 2.3 million dot OLED EVF, which is standard for a camera in this price range. That's what you get. Is it bad? No. Is it say the R6 Mark II or even the Sony A7R5? Absolutely not. Again, this is an entry level full frame camera, my friends, and I'm gonna be repeating that quite often throughout this video. I did find it to have good eye relief. The diopter worked very well. There was no eye strain on my part and God, you know, it works. EVF technology has definitely come a long way and it's nice to see even the entry level cameras now start to creep up as far as EVF quality. This does have 120 refresh hertz, uh, megahertz on the refresh rate, which is really nice. 
not a year and a half, two years ago, we saw it at 60 and only on flagships did they offer 120 and you had to actually go and select that. It wasn't by default. So it's nice to see that come up. Now, when we talk about the back panel, this is a 1.6 million dot. That's what I was thinking of. And that's definitely standard issue. And it's definitely nothing to write home about. Will it get the job done? Sure. But if I can, my choice, I'm definitely gonna use the EVF because I'm gonna get a better quality picture as far as that goes. And as you can see, this does have a full articulating screen. As far as that standard issue on just about every single new release camera today. Um, now, I'm gonna put my glasses on really quick. Now, when it comes to ports, we have all the usual suspects here. Um, we have our microphone input up top, okay, for external audio. We have our micro HDMI and we have our USB-C, which this does actually have power delivery over USB-C, which is nice. And again, that is going to be standard issue for a majority of cameras coming out today is that power delivery over USB-C. I'd still like to see manufacturers follow Panasonic suit and turn that USB-C to where we can actually record to an external SSD. It can be done, Panasonic's doing it. There's no excuse other than a money grab on media, another video for another time. And then down here, this is your remote, I'm sorry, down here, <clears throat> we have our microphone input and our headphone input if you want to monitor your audio, which is nice. Um, definitely some features that we did not see in the R50, which I wouldn't expect to, because that's an entry level crop sensor camera at $800. So it's nice to see that Canon uh, has added all those features. We are using the LP17 battery, a little disappointed in that. I was really hoping that they would do the LP6, uh, the ELP6, I think, is actually technically what it's called. Battery for this like they did in the R6 Mark II, the R7, and of course all the flagship cameras going forward as far as that goes. The battery life is okay. I mean, it's what I would expect from that battery, but if they would have done the six, you would have gotten a little bit better battery life. It would have made it a bigger footprint. Now, this is noticeably smaller in the hand than the R6 Mark II. It still feels good though. That being said, I don't want anybody to think this is just you know a tiny camera with no ergonomics. This still feels good. I like the grip. I wish it were a little deeper, LP6. Um, but it still works really well. The button layout is something that we've come accustomed to with Canons, and I'm gonna do that in a separate video. I do like the fact that they have the separate photo and video. However, I wish they would have put this control over here, so instead of having to use my other hand, I can use you know one-handed functionality as far as that goes. Again, these are just some ergonomic issues <clears throat> not saying that it's a deal breaker for necessarily me if I were to buy one or you if you were to consider buying one. So, um, full touch screen, which is nice. Um, again, standard issue for what we see on cameras today. Now, when it comes to what you can shoot with this, JPEG, RAW, and yes, you could shoot the HEIF or what I refer to as HEF. I wish that didn't exist. It's horribly compressed. I can't stand it. That's my opinion on it. We're gonna move on. So you have JPEG RAW um, uh, photography, um, 12 frames per second on the front curtain. If you're shooting the electronic shutter, Canon says you can get up to 40 frames a second. That's right, 40 frames per second, but there's a bivy of caveats to that. I'm gonna link to the Canon website down below so you can read all those. Again, nothing against Canon, but we refer to it as the Canon Crippler. A lot of other reviewers that I've seen talk about this camera refer to it as the Canon Crippler. On average though, garden variety, electronic shutter, you can expect to get it right around 20 frames per second. I tested this out. That seems to be the accurate average. So take it for what it's worth and we'll move on from there. Um, you are gonna have your sRGB and your RGB color space for your JPEGs, that's pretty standard. This has the dual pixel autofocus, which Canon, you know, it's their answer to Sony's autofocus, it works. And in this camera, it works noticeably better than the R50 and the RP. And of course, RP being a little older, R50 being entry level crop sensor. But I was pleasantly surprised on just how well it works. So um, it acquired quickly, stayed locked on really, really well, better in video than the R50 was and the RP. So that's good. So yes, dual pixel autofocus, working, it's alive and well, working very well. And you have 90%
coverage of your sensor going horizontally. Now, a lot of people say, well, what about vertically? For the most part these days, everything's 100% going vertically. It's horizontally where we see 90, 92, 87, whatever the case may be. This has 90% coverage going horizontally. So um, not stellar, I, I would call that average, but still for an entry level camera, they could have done a whole lot worse. We do have eye and face detection on this, and we do have subject detection. Now, the modes in subject detection are auto, which worked really well in identifying different subjects that had an eye, people, animals, birds. I didn't get a chance to try to shoot any insects, or it specifically says horses in the menu, um, or on the menu in the literature, which horse is an animal. So. <laughs> um, but it did work well, and I was quite impressed by how well it worked in the auto mode. And this is one thing I wish Sony would bring to their cameras where you don't have necessarily an auto mode. You can leave it in people and I've still had luck with it identifying other creatures, mammals, warm-blooded creatures in on their eye. But Sony's, Sony cameras noticeably work better if you make that selection. I would like to see Sony add this to it. Will they? I'm not sure, but Canon's doing a pretty good job of that so far. Now, when we talk about ISO, and here's where I get a little bit honorary with all camera manufacturers because this is a source of contention with me and marketing, deceptive marketing as far as I'm concerned. This camera will shoot at a base ISO of 100 up to 102,000. No one's gonna shoot 102,000 with this camera, okay? The picture looks like crap, okay? Absolute crap, there's no saving it. So, let's be honest with each other. This camera, I would not shoot over 6,400 ISO on garden variety photography if I had to push it to 12,800 ISO. But now you're talking a lot of noise correction and post. Is that a bad thing? Nah, it's average for this you know, type of camera, entry level full frame. You know, But the marketing, please guys, I, I know. Sony does the same thing, so does Nikon. Realistically, you can shoot this camera all day long at 6,400. I did take some photos at 6400 and it was nothing that Topaz couldn't clean up. 12,800, a little bit different story. It was a little rough. And even trying to clean that noise up, either using Topaz or Lightroom's new noise, denoise AI, it didn't look really good. Almost uh, too processed, a little plasticky, depending on the photo and everything like that. But still, in a pinch, if you needed to, you have it. Now, when we talk about shutter speeds, well, we'll keep going with the ISO. We'll get the shutter speed in a second. But when we talk about ISO 2, you know, you have auto ISO, but the auto ISO is actually different if you're using a flash, okay? Flash bank is 1 200th of a second, which is pretty much standard for this type of camera. But when we look at the ISO for a compatible lens, what Canon deems is a compatible lens, that's an RF mount, okay? You get 100 to 6400 auto ISO, which again, is where you wanna be anyways. But if you're using an incompatible lens, okay, that's anything other than an RF mount, including an EF mount with an adapter, it's 100 to 1600 auto ISO. And that's important to note for some photographers who wanna use a flash on TTL and set their ISO to auto, if you need more than 1600, it ain't gonna work. So beware of that. Again, one of those caveats, one of those asterisks. Now, when we come to, when we talk about <clears throat> the shutter speed on this, it's one four thousandths of a second, which is kind of standard for a front curtain, you know, mechanical type shutter. This camera doesn't technically have a mechanical shutter, it's just front curtain only, I know. But when we go to electronic mode, we jump up to one eight thousandths of a second, which is standard issue for an electronic shutter. The nice thing about this camera is where on the R50, that's where it stops. This camera, if you go into TV, which is shutter priority or manual mode, you can actually achieve a shutter speed of up to 1 thousandths of a second, which is pretty impressive. We've seen these kind of specs on cameras that are mid to you know upper echelon cameras from Canon and Sony both. So it's nice that they've decided to add this in. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you have the Canon 50, you know, F12, you know, lens on this, and you go out in the middle of the day, and you forgot to take an ND filter, and you're shooting wide open at 1.2, if you're in manual or shutter priority, you can actually do it with this camera. Because I'm telling you right now, wide open at 1.2 in the middle of the day in Arizona sunlight, <laughs> It ain't gonna happen unless you have a filter, so I'm here to tell you on that. So um, it's nice. 
it's a good job. It's a nice addition for you know this camera as far as that goes. Now, when we talk about stabilization, there's no IVIS. There's no mechanical stabilization in this at all, and that's kind of tragic. Now, you do have uh, digital stabilization, which will give you a 1.2 crop, and then you have enhanced di digital stabilization, which will give you an additional crop of 1.6. Not on top of the 1.2, it's just 1.6. So if you're using this with the digitally enhanced stabilization, it's like shooting a crop sensor camera. You have to take that into effect with your focal length. If you are shooting a 35 millimeter lens and turn on the enhanced digital stabilization, the crop effect is 1.6. So now your 35 millimeter lens turns into more of a 56, 55 millimeter lens. And that's something you should know as far as full frame equivalent on the focal length. And your depth of field is gonna change. It's not a surprise. Digital stabilization crops occur. This is the same thing for Sony cameras. So it's not like it's a ding for Canon. It's just you need to know for this camera, no IBIS, no mechanical stabilization, digital stabilization only with a crop. So that being said, we'll move on. Now, this, in terms of video, shoots 8-bit and 10-bit video, again, with some caveats. We have 8-bit video and an H.264 okay, codec, which I like. Okay, It's an MPEG-4. It's very versatile. It's very useful. And I found that on standard profile in 8-bit, it was actually quite pleasing. The colors were not oversaturated, and I can add a little bit of cat contrast, and in some cases, saturation to taste to really bring out the vibrance of the image without overdoing it. So if you're not a big color grader and you're still going to be recording 8-bit video, which you can with this camera, that's the way to go. Um, now when we talk about the 10-bit options, here's where it gets a little bit interesting. And again, kind of that Canon Crippler. You can shoot 10-bit, and what Canon refers to, and I've said this many times before, I just want to make sure I get it right, it's HDRPQ, not HQ, but HDRPQ. That's 10-bit, it's H.265, it's horribly compressed, and in my opinion, horribly oversaturated. I said this about the R50. You do not have an option to record your 10-bit in the R50 in other, any other way than HDRPQ, in H.265. You can't even choose to record it in H.264, and we'll talk about that here in just a minute when we get to Canon Log. So that, my friends, though, on that particular profile, again, in my opinion, it's oversaturated. There's not much you can do with it in post-production. I would stay away from it, which brings us to our third option, which I'm actually quite impressed to see this camera have, and that is Canon Log 3. This is a fully, well, I don't want to say fully, but you can apply a color transform node in DaVinci Resolve, always use DaVinci Resolve, <clears throat> to color grade this footage. It is 10-bit. It is 422. The problem is, is you are now also still forced to record in that H.265. It will not allow you to record H.264 all intra. This is a mistake in my opinion, and the reason is, is H.265 the compression is aggressive, and for most people, their machines struggle to edit because of the compression. Where people make a big deal about uh, disk okay, um, uh, storage as far as that and file size and everything, I only record in H.264, 4K, all intra. That's it, 10-bit, 422. Don't have any issues with it. The files edit beautifully. I don't have to do... Uh, any type of proxies. It's really the way to go. I wish camera companies would understand that. You're not doing anybody any favors by forcing them, forcing them to do H.265 long op. There's no benefit to it, my friends, in my opinion. Chime down below if you think I'm wrong or off base or agree or whatever the case may be, but I really wish they would give us the option. There's no reason why they couldn't give us the option on this camera. Canon just decided not to. Where when I reviewed the Fuji X-H2, okay, I said they gave way too many options. Canon's not given us enough in this case. And I really think it's an option, no matter what I'm recording in 8-bit or 10-bit, to be able to do that H.264 all intra 4K. But you can't. 
The only way to do that, all intra, is in the H.265, and that's only in Canon Log 3. So, but C Log, it edits very well. Again, on DaVinci, did the color transform. It looked nice. It was easy to manipulate. I had no problems with it. And as far as the color space that you get with the Canon Log, we have uh, 709, Rec 709, Rec 2020, BT 2020, and we have that uh, uh, Canon Cinema Gamut, which is actually very nice. Now, of course, you can add a LUT to this if you're recording in Log and you know do whatever you want to do as far as creative adjustments but to let you know it's got some solid video footage and i think this has some potential but the fact again there's so many different asterisks and so many caveats on frame rates that you're recording and what it actually does when you're recording those frame rates it's it's mind-bending it was two full pages my friends again links down below go to canon check it out now <clears throat> this will record up to 4K60 without a crop in most situations, and it will record uh, 1080 at 180 frames per second without a crop in most situations. Um, this is oversampled from 6K footage, not pixel bend or line skipped, which is you know good to know. It's the way to do it, um, but with a 24 megapixel sensor, I am not surprised that it's it's uh, oversampled from that 6K. And again, pretty standard for a 24 megapixel or a 33 megapixel in that manner, um, sensor oversampling from 6K or 6.2K or whatever the case may be. It's commonplace now and I'm glad to see that's what Canon is doing on this. Now, as far as heat management goes, I didn't get this camera to overheat. I got it to actually heat up more than the R50. Kind of surprised, kind of not surprised on that. Um, but not once did it actually clip and shut down. Now, when I was recording video, I had the screen flipped out to allow more heat dissipation. And this back part right here does get very, very, very warm. Um, I tried with the power delivery through USB-C and the regular battery recording at 24, uh, 4K24. Where it heated up the most was recording at uh, 4K60 and the higher frame rates in HD. But I also tested this outside where the ambient air temperature was 85 degrees and I'm in the sun and the sun is beating down on the camera, which means it's absorbing heat. When camera or Canon or Sony for that matter sets their standards as far as thermal management and telling you what it can and cannot do, they're in a lab. It's climate controlled like I am right now. And if you're going to use this indoors for a photo shoot or recording video for YouTube or something like that, I don't think you're going to have that much of a problem because most people keep their space between 76 and 80 degrees. You're also not in the blazing sun as far as that goes. So I don't see this camera overheating. Now, there were some reviewers that said that they, you know, the Canon R8 overheats. Nah, you watch their video and it really didn't. Um, or it was just in the most extreme of conditions shenanigans okay most people are going to use this for basic photography and video most people i think are going to be using this indoor for youtube and that's okay nothing wrong with that and i think for most people that's going to work just fine and you won't have any overheating issues so before we start talking about my opinion and who this camera's for let's talk a little bit about our partner today Photo Forum. Now, Photo Forum's been in the Valley of the Sun for over 50 years, and for that time, they have been a fixture, a hub for the photography community here. In the last couple years, we've come on strong, becoming a hub and a resource center for our local videographers. Everything's about the media or mirrorless hybrid shooter these days, my friend. And since the beginning of 2023, I have made a concentrated effort to make Photo Forum the community location for photographers and videographers alike, doing group photo walks, video walks, group hikes, uh, interactive classes. We are truly striving every day to make Photo Forum a better place, not only for everybody that works there, including me, but for everybody who comes in. They have a pleasing experience. They don't feel intimidated. And at the end of the day, they know they can come back with any questions and learn something. Cause that's what it's all about. Customers learning from us and us learning from our customers as well sometimes. So 
When you're in the Valley of the Sun, you're thinking photography or videography, think about Photo Forum. Stop in, give us a visit. There's going to be a link down below. If you have any questions, you can call. I'm typically there on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays when I'm in town. So that being said, who is this camera for? Well, I think, I believe, let me rephrase that. And this is my opinion. And contrary to canon literature, where the R50 definitely replaced the M50 and the Rebel series camera. I think this is also a replacement for that M50 and Rebel series camera, but I also think it's a replacement for like the 90D or the 60 Mark I, you know, that full frame uh, DSLR experience and someone's getting ready to upgrade. They're ready, they've learned a bunch using the DSLR camera and now they're ready to get into that RF mount. At $1499, this is actually very compelling. It's $500 more expensive for the RP, so for someone who has a little bit more money to spend in their budget, this is a good choice. <clears throat> we get an updated chipset, we get updated focusing, we get updated video capabilities from the RP. But at $1699 with a lens, I also feel that the R7 is just as a compelling choice if you could spend just a little bit more money because the R7 at 1899 comes with a lens. You get IBIS as well as digital stabilization. You get two card slots instead of one, <clears throat> and you get an amazing 18 to 150, which crops out to be a 28 to 60 on the full frame uh, focal length equivalent <clears throat> lens included with that thing. It's dynamite, and I've said it many times before, and I hold fast to that statement, that that Canon R7 is a one-and-done camera for Canon, probably the best one-and-done camera of the last six months. I think that was actually released almost a year ago. Truly superb, and the crop sensor takes stunning images and is actually really, really good in low light. I think it's better than this one in low light. Not quite the R6 Mark II, but uh, neck and neck. So if you have the budget and you're looking to upgrade from those entry-level DSLR cameras, this is a compelling option, okay, as well as the R7. They share the same technology. The R7 actually does 20 frames a second as well. So I think it would just depend on if you're really looking to get into full frame or if you're looking for a one-and-done camera to suit all your photography and videography needs and is going to last with the additional weather sailing everything it would be a tough call and i'd want to talk to a person individually to see what their uh, photographic and, and video aspirations are before i you know decided to put them in one specific camera but if you decided to go with the r8 i don't think you're making a bad choice this gets your foot into the door as far as the prevailing technology which is mirrorless cameras it gets you started down the path of the rf mount which Let's face it, I may be a Sony shooter, but I'm not going to deny the quality of lenses Canon produces. The RF lenses are equivalent to the EF L series lenses. Are you kidding me? That 51.2 and the 70 to 200 F2.8 are both phenomenal lenses. That's a one two punch right there, my friends. It might sound a little bit dramatic, but I just don't want anybody to think that I'm a Sony fanboy. I love Sony cameras and I would never change. I shoot other cameras than Sony for personal you know, enjoyment, but <clears throat> when it comes to professionally, it's Sony. But I also know they have their limitations as well. And Sony doesn't have an entry-level full-frame camera that even comes close to this. Sony's entry-level full-frame camera at the moment is going to be the a7 IV, okay? And at $2,500, that's $1,000 more than this. So again, very compelling option we have here with the R8 for a majority of Canon shooters that are looking to upgrade. So whether you agree with me or not is up for debate, I guess. Time will tell. Comment down below, guys. Seriously, if you have any questions, anything that I've missed, ask down below. If you agree with me or you disagree with me, comment down below. Let me know what you think. My only, only rule is that you be respectful. That's it, okay? So on that note, my friends, seriously, like, subscribe, bell notification icon, it's the trifecta, helps out the video, helps out the channel. We have some links down below, Photo Forum, our partner for today, all right? Follow that link, you can go to their website, you can call the shop here in Phoenix if you have any questions. Again, I'm there Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Talk to me, talk to one of my great coworkers. We're all super people and we will help you no matter what you need. 
unless you're asking financial advice on the Nikkei index that we can't do for you. We also have some social media links down below. One of those will be Photo Forum, and the other ones are going to be for Get Out Arizona, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. It's the devil's work, but it's needed, all right, to get the word out for Get Out Arizona. We do group hikes. We group, do group bike rides, Photo Forum. We do group photo walks, so make sure you subscribe to their social media, too. No matter what, Photo Forum, Get Out Arizona, we're completely interactive and we love doing it. We love being a part of that community. There's gonna be other links down below that are Amazon affiliate links. If you follow one of those links and you make a qualifying purchase, you're gonna be charged or won't be charged an additional amount, but we'll receive a small commission, which helps out with gas money, park money, coffee money. It's the other trifecta that we love so much here at Get Out Arizona. So on that note, my friends, seriously, what do we always say? Be kind to yourself and others. Be amazing stewards on that trail. And we have to ask, what are you waiting for? Get out of Arizona. We'll see you on that next adventure and hopefully with a camera in your hand. Take care, everybody.